Praise the Lord. Morning, family. Wow. God is great. And greatly to be praised. You know, I think sometimes we have too small an idea of who our God is. Amen. Our God is huge. He's mighty. He's wonderful. He's glorious. Let's give him the praise that he so richly deserves. Let's just bow our heads just for a second. Heavenly Father, I just come before you and I ask that you would speak through this word today to all our hearts, Father. Let your word be heard, not mine. And let your name be glorified and not mine. For I ask it in and through the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Turn to Ephesians 4, please. Ephesians chapter 4. Is that too loud? No. Okay. Can't hear it very well here. So. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read the first 24 verses. Ephesians 4 from verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation or calling to which you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called, in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he said, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, thank you Nikos, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, who unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the man, Christ Jesus. And to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, sorry. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, heard that again today, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened and being alienated from the life of God through ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness and to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation or the ways of the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And may God bless his word. Praise the Lord. I want to thank uh, David and... and, uh, Zoe for for sharing the scriptures that they shared today because it really fits in with what I would with what I want to say today and uh, the one from that David spoke of um, in Chronicles there um, where was it now twenty two verse 
19, yeah. Now set your hearts and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise therefore and build you the sanctuary of the Lord God to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels into the house. Set your hearts to seek God. Amen? Amen. Amen. What's the purpose of church? No, strike that. What's the purpose of assembling together? We are the church. This isn't church. We are the church. We're the living stones. Amen? So what's the purpose of gathering together? Where's your place in that assembly? And how does that affect your life in the world? Three questions. And I would imagine that every single one in this place at some time or other have pondered one or more of those questions. Three questions. How many have pondered them? You might be thinking about it right now. Why do we get together? What's my place here? What's my purpose here? And how does that affect my life in the world? Well, we're going to look at that today. And the Apostle Paul in in the the section of the letter to the the believers in Ephesus that I read is, is one good example of Paul wanting to share his experience and his knowledge to the brothers and the sisters in Ephesus. Paul was in prison when he wrote this. And so these were some of the last words that he would have written. Do you think they probably would have been important words? Of course they were. So we're going to look at them and see what he and the Lord Jesus wants us to understand from this. I've called this message, In Jesus' Name. Now that might sound funny from what I've just read, but bear with me. It's important. In Jesus' name. I wonder how many people here have often used that phrase. Use it when you pray or, or, or whatever. In Jesus' name. And, and, and we use it a lot, don't we? I've used it. I still use it. Yeah? But what does it mean? What does it mean to you to say, in Jesus' name? Is it a a special phrase, a formula that you use? Or do you think it holds some magical power to, to grab the heart of God? Do you think it has any, it's like a special key that we can use to, to open the heart of God to answer our prayer or to do what he wants? Of course it isn't, is it? But what does it mean? In Jesus' name. Jesus instructed us in his own words in several ways to use to speak those things John 16 verse 26 says this at that day you shall ask in my name and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you and he goes on to say because the Father loves you he will do it from his love for you or again to gather in his name he encourages us to say this For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. We heard that again today. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Or even Luke 21 verse 8. That was Matthew 18 verse 20 by the way. Luke 21 verse 8 says this, And he said, Take heed that you be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, or I am Messiah, and the time draweth near, go you not therefore after them. Many will come in my name. What does it mean? In my name. Well, there's obviously something far more significant about that phrase, isn't there? than just at the end of a prayer, tacking on, in Jesus' name. And then everybody saying, Amen. It's far more important than we sometimes realise. And we're going to look at that. So what does it mean? Well, if we look at marriage, we get some idea. When a man and a woman come together in marriage, they go through the ceremony, and the wife takes on the surname of the husband, doesn't she? So she lives in his name. 
They become one flesh. Under God, they become one person. United. They become one flesh. And that taking on of the husband's name is a symbol of that. So, wherever they go, wherever they are, whether together or alone, they represent the other. Because they're part of the whole. They protect one another when they're alone. I hope you do anyway. You protect your spouse if someone is slandering them, wouldn't you? Maybe not. You protect them, wouldn't you? Yes. Okay. So you get the idea that when you become one in marriage, you're becoming one flesh. Taking on that name really symbolises the fact that you're no longer two individuals. You become one unit. And the longer... How many people have been married here over five years? Put your hands up. How many people here have been married over 20 years? How many people have been married over 30 years? How many people have been married over 40 years? Praise the Lord. 50? Not quite. But I want to ask you, the longer you are married, do you become closer together? Do you tend to think more alike? You become to know what the other likes, what the other dislikes. How the other feels, even if they don't say how they're feeling. Sometimes just by their quietness you know how they feel. Is that right? But it's that growing together, isn't it? It's that growing together as one that is is the thing, isn't it? And that really is what being in the name means. It's being in the character of in the nature of. If you look at the phrase in the Hebrew, that's exactly what it means. To be in the nature of. In the character of. Or after the character or the nature of. That person. And in this case, it's in the nature of Jesus Christ, our Lord. They're no longer two people. They're one. And they think and move as one. The, the more that they live together, the more that they are together, the more they share together and the the more they work together as one. It becomes one beautiful, united person. And that is exactly the picture of the relationship between Jesus Christ and his body. Why do you think God instituted marriage? It's a picture for us of how he wants to dwell with us. So it really means in the same character of. And it's a picture or a type or a shadow, if you like, of our relationship with Yeshua, the bridegroom. We are his bride. And this is why Paul, in going on now, this is why Paul in, in our text in Ephesians is exhorting the believers in Ephesus He wants them to realise that each one of them now is joined to a husband. Each one of them is becoming united to the Saviour. And is meant to become united to the Saviour because they are now representatives on the earth of that Saviour. And everything that they do and everything that they say reflects on his name. Wherever they go. I want us to really think about this today. And I want to read through again Ephesians, just the first few verses. Ephesians 4 verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation. In some versions it says the calling to which you were called with lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That doesn't mean forcing opinions on one another. Does it? If you try and force your opinion on your husband or your wife, it won't work out too well. And it doesn't work in the body of Christ either. 
we're to endeavour to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, discussing things, preferring one another, and allow the Lord to show us the truth of what he's trying to say. There is one body, one spirit, even as you are called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now I find that an incredibly interesting statement. And it should take pressure off every single person in this congregation. Let me read that again. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So what does that mean? Well, it means that God, in his mercy, has given every single member in this place a portion of his grace it's not the same as the one next to you it may be less it may be more but it's in its power and in its effectiveness it's the same because it enables each and every one of you no matter what stage you're at no matter what ability you have to understand or to, to, to recount the word of God That amount of grace that God has given you is to enable you to achieve the fullness and the stature of the man Christ Jesus. Because he knows you. Let me read it again. But unto every one of us, who is us? Us. Every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. He goes on to explain why this is. And that God has given, they used to be called the fivefold ministries. Do any of you remember that? Fivefold ministries. So many crazy things happened with that. But he said he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers to the body of Christ. Why did he give them? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we, what? All come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. So God has given ministries in the body, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, But why? For the perfecting of the saints. That word perfecting, by the way, is, in the Hebrew, means completely furnish. To give the tools for. That's all it means. It doesn't mean to say that every single leader or ministry, let's say, any gifted ministry in the body of Christ knows it all, has it all, and is going to give it to you when he likes. That's not what it's about. Gifting is given in the body of Messiah for one reason and one reason only. And that is to share the tools that we need to bring us to a place of hearing from the Lord. It's our responsibility to go to him and to hear him and to receive from him. All these ministries do is to enable us to be in a place where we can do that. In essence, the gift ministries in the body 
I believe, you may differ, are like the Levites in the Old Testament. I believe it's, in a sense, in a way, it's, it's like the ministry of the Levites. The Levites were what? They were the experts in the law. They studied the law. They wrote the scrolls, the scribes. They were experts in the law. They were lawyers. And it was their job to teach the people what to do, how to live, how to, how to stand before the living God so that they weren't smitten or smited, whichever way you have to put it, so they didn't end up stoned to death. It was to enable them to be able to come before the living God in righteousness. What is righteousness? It's doing and saying and thinking that which is right. It's not brain, you know, it's not brain surgery. It's simple. Being righteous before God is having our mind renewed. Our lives clean before him. Our hearts set after God and ready to receive from him and ready to be obedient to him when we do here. Isn't that what it's all about? That is why God gave these gifts in the body. Not because they're any special. They're exactly the same as us. They had to learn the same as we have to learn. But their responsibilities are really also our responsibilities. Because they are there for what reason? For the perfecting of the saints or the complete furnishing of the saints for the work of ministry. What does that mean? It means their job is to recognise and to nurture and to raise up those who will take over from them and do exactly the same to others. Teach them, nurture them, see them raised up and carry on. It's a rolling programme, isn't it? It's not just a university where you've got the same teachers all the time because we die. We come, we go. We're nothing special. God can raise up the stones to teach you. We're no different. As, as, as a preacher, I'm no different to you. I have failings, Lynn will tell you. Not many. <laughs> but, but I have failings. David has failings. Probably not as many as me, does he, Zoe? No, there you go. But you see, we're all men. We're all men and women. But God has placed his gift to the measure of his choosing in each and every one of us. And these ministries are there to recognise that, to encourage that, to nurture that, and to see it raised up and used in the body of Messiah. That's what it's all about. So in essence, that's really what the Levites did. The priests took care of the sacrificial stuff. That was their job. The Levites took care of the everyday stuff. But they also taught the people. And we're going to look at that in a moment. Teachers, by the way, are not here, and preachers aren't here to teach you everything about God. I'm sorry to deflate you. And I'll tell you a secret. We don't know everything. Really? Thank you, brother. <laughs> Truly, we don't know everything. David doesn't know everything. Jacob doesn't know everything. Tom Laurie doesn't know everything. None of us know everything. Only one knows everything, and he is at the right hand of the Father in glory. We will know him one day, because we'll be like him. Amen? But we don't know everything. So don't just sit there week after week expecting to learn everything from us. Because that isn't what it's about. Our job, if you like, if you want to call it a job or a ministry, is, is to preach the word 
to teach you, or and teach us, teach ourselves as well, the ways of the Lord. To, to proclaim his precepts, his commandments, the things that please him and the things that don't please him. So that then we can take that unto ourselves. We can go home and we can study this for ourselves with that in mind and walk rightly before him. That's why we come together. And I believe Paul explains this so well in Ephesians 4. Let's read that again. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting or complete furnishing of the saints. Who are the saints? Come on, believers. Who are the saints? Believe it. That's what you are. For the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Did you know it's part of your responsibility to edify me? And to edify Dave and the children and Zoe and one another. We're to edify one another. We're to build one up, build each other up in the faith. That's what family does, isn't it? Till we all come, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what it's all about. That's why we come together. And that's why Scripture tells us that we should gather together more and more as we see the day approaching. Because we need each other. We need each other's encouragement. We need each other's challenge to our lives. Sometimes we need that sandpaper next to us. To knock off those rough edges that God's been so longing for years to knock off us. To make us malleable, teachable, usable for his purposes. And not one of us are any different in this respect. We're all in the same position. You know, there's a very often quoted scripture which is always used, seems to be always used when... Uh, you're ordaining pastors or something like that. And it's that well-known scripture from Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Can anybody finish it? That's right. Yeah. But you see, Paul shared that with Timothy. But that wasn't just for Timothy. That's for each and every one of us. Study to show yourselves approved unto God. Why? So we know what pleases Him. So we know what displeases Him. So that we know how to rightly walk before Him. And rightly reflect His likeness in the world. That's why we do it. And it's true that somebody who's in a a place of responsibility, authority for want of another word. Responsibility in the body, a pastor or a teacher, preacher or whatever may be, has an extra responsibility because he's not only given charge of his own life, he's given charge of, of teaching and preaching to others. And so scripture says that to them is given a, a double judgment. Because we're not only responsible for our lives and how we live, but we're also responsible to God for the teaching that we bring to the body. So we're all responsible. We're all to recognise and nurture others in the Lord. As I've already said, this is exactly what the Levites did. They were teachers of their day. Let's look at a couple of examples. Second Chronicles, if you want to jot these down and read them for yourselves later. Second Chronicles 35, verses 5 
and 6. Second Chronicles 35, verses 5 and 6. This is King Josiah. And stand in the holy place according to the divisions of the families of the fathers of your brethren, the people, after the division of the families of the Levites. So kill the Passover and sanctify yourselves and prepare your brethren that they may do according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Josiah was a good king. He knew how to get his people understanding and knowledge. It was to use the wisdom and the knowledge of the Levites, the scribes, the teachers, the, those who wrote down the law, those who understood the precepts and the commands of God. The second one, a clear, more clear example, if you like, is, is 2 Chronicles 17, a little bit previous, verses 7 to 10. This is Jehoshaphat, another good king. 2 Chronicles 17, verse 7. Also in the third year of his reign, he sent to his princes, even to ben and to Obadiah, and to Zechariah, and to Nathaniel, and Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them he sent Levites, even Shemaiah, and Nataniah, and Zabadiah, and Asael, and Shemarot, and Jehonan, Je- <laughs> Jehonathan, Jehonathan, in other words, and Adoniah, and Tobiah, and Tabadai Onai, <laughs> some of these names, boy. I do choose some difficult scriptures for myself sometimes. Levites, and with them Elishama and Jehoram, priests. And they taught in Judah, and had the book of the law of the Lord with them, and went about throughout all the cities of Judah, and taught the people. And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdom of the lands that were round about Judah, so that they made no more war against Jehoshaphat. Why? Why did the nations fear? Round about them. There were some powerful nations round about Jehoshaphat at this time. Why did they fear? They feared because the Jews, the Israelites, knew who they were. And they knew their God because they'd been taught the law by the Levites. They had been taught. uh, They had recounted to them the exploits that God had done before them from Egypt and, and, and so on. And how great God was and how much love he had for his people. And when his people were in obedience, how mighty they were in the face of their enemies. That's why their enemies feared them. Because they knew their God. And they were right before him. Because they'd been taught to be right before him by the Levites. Who read them the law. Who read them the instruction on how to live worthy of the calling to which they've been called. So... If you like, as it was with the Levites, so it is with the gift ministers in the church or in the body. We're we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God that we might, as in our text in Ephesians tells us, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. How do we know how to edify one another? Edify means to strengthen. To encourage. You strengthen and encourage each other by knowing the word of God. And sharing it with someone. And along with your own testimony of what God has done for you. Maybe in similar circumstances. And as I said, the word perfecting here in the Greek is katartismos. Katartismos, which means completely furnished. In other words, it's to give you the tools that you need to be able to find your own answers from God. Basically, that's what it is. It's to help you to find your own answers from God because you know how to live before him. You know what pleases him. You know what displeases him. You know how to approach him 
with reverence and fear, in holiness and in worship, thanksgiving, like we have done this morning. And when you know how to approach him, you'll be in a position to receive from him. Because then you'll know how to put it into practice. How to make his word flesh in your life. In other words, to fully equip the saints to live righteously before God and that they may in turn be able to equip others to do the same. Like I've said, who are the saints? You are. He's talking about you. Equipping you to receive from God. And Paul even tells us what the end result of this is in verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. Isn't that the whole point? Till we all come in the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. How do we know the Son of God? How do we know his character? We read about him. We read about what he did. And we listen to what he is doing. And even in our lives. Unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. A measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Remember I said right at the beginning that God has given grace according to the measure to each one of us. We can all achieve that fullness to which God has intended for us. Every single one of us. If we allow him to. Every single one of us. Because he has given us that grace. When we got born again, when we got renewed from above, whatever you want to call it, when you got saved, when your life got changed from glory to glory, that grace was imparted into your life. The mind of, gr- mind of Christ was imparted into your mind. And his grace is there to enable you to make the most of that. To study, to show yourself approved unto God and to live righteously before him. So right at the beginning, I asked the questions, what's the purpose of church? What is the purpose of gathering together? What's my place in it? And how does that affect my life out there in the world? We began by understanding a phrase, in my name. In my name. And this really is the essence of the answer that God, I believe, has laid on my heart in this message. That we really and truly understand what it means to be in his name. Because the whole point of the ministries that God has has placed in the body of Christ is to guide each and every saint towards the character and nature of Jesus Christ. So that they can achieve that level of fullness of the stature of Christ that God intended for you. Through an increased knowledge of the word of God and an understanding of his ways. Understanding of how he, he, he moves amongst us. And what he does through us and in us. And only then by our obedience and submission. Oh, there's a nasty word. Not talked very much in churches anymore, is it? Submission to the word of God. Submission to the Son of God. It's gone awful quiet. There is, a, there is an important sense where we need to submit to his will. Because his will has to become our will. Because until that happens, we are not in 
Jesus' name. And we can not be in Jesus' name if our will is not subjected, submitted to his. Only then by our obedience and submission are we truly in his name. Or can we ask in his name or gather in his name? Now do you understand why I chose that phrase today, in his name? Will you think about that a little bit differently when, when you use it? in future I will now I'm not in any way saying that you're not to use that phrase I'm not saying that at all but understand what it really means to be in his name to gather in his name to be called and chosen in his name Ephesians 4 verse 7 and verse 16 tell us that God has given us, every one of us, the grace we need to achieve this task. And the same amount, as I've said before, is not given to everybody, but enough is given so that each can live as they should live before a holy God. The whole point of the body coming together, in answer to the first question, is that we can grow in his righteousness. We can grow in his righteousness. We learn to walk rightly before him. His life becomes our life and we're conformed to his likeness. That's why we come together. My place in that assembly, in that congregation, is where he puts me. It's not of my choosing. His place in the congregation, in the assembly of God, is where he wants me, for as long as he wants me there. Until he decides to move me to something else, to raise me to some other ministry, or to send me out to some other ministry, or whatever. It's up to him. He'll raise me for whatever he has purpose for my life. How does that affect my life in the world? Well, there's a logical progression here, isn't there? If I've been obedient in whatever the Lord's put before me, then I'll be, I'll be, more, I'll be moving, walking, living in the character of Jesus. I will be, if you like, a little Christ. And I say that guardedly. I will walk after the likeness of Christ. Do you know, that's what really being a disciple actually means. Is being that rabbi that you follow. I spoke before one time about the idea of a disciple in in Jesus' day and before was not to be like the rabbi, but to be the rabbi. To be where he was In God. Is that your desire today? Is that your desire when you come into this place? Is that your desire when we meet together for a prayer meeting or a a Bible study? To be like him? To be just like him? To be after the character of Jesus. Then the world will see him and not me. The world will see his likeness and see and fear and turn to him. That's what it's all about. That's why we're here. To be lights in the darkness. To be little Christs in the earth. And to close I want to read John 15, from verse 1 to 19. I know it's a lot of scripture, but it really ties up what we're saying here today. And I want you to understand from all the things that I've said what God is trying to say through this last scripture. And remember, I'm not saying that you're not to use the phrase in Jesus' name 
or in his name. Just bear in mind what it really means. John 15 verse 1. Jesus speaking. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit he purges it, that it might bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatever you will and it shall be done to you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you. And that your joy might be full. This is my command, that you love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known to you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world... But I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. There's an encouraging word for you, brothers and sisters. The world hates you. And it always will hate you. Because God loves you. And Jesus has given his life for you. And he is building you as living stones into his temple. In the end, it's all about abiding. Do you know he uses the word abide nine times in those few sentences, those few verses. Do you think he's trying to tell you something? Abiding, living, dwelling in Christ, in him, in his love, in his life, in his way, in his truth, in his nature, being one with him as in the marriage. You've taken on his name. Live worthy of the calling to which he's called you. And you know, until we understand this process of why we're here, who we are, where our place is, and what our purpose is out there, we'll continue to be blown about by the winds of doctrine. Because we won't know our place. Our place is in him. Our lives are hidden in him. In heavenly places. And we'll be reunited with him one day. Soon, God willing. Maranatha, Lord, come soon. But that's that's the purpose of why we gather together. Our whole purpose is to learn to live in his name. To be one with him. So that we can rightly reflect his glory in the earth. God bless you. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for your word. Pray that, Lord, you would help us to draw near. Help us to understand. Lord, cleanse our minds of all worldly things. 
Help us to focus on that which is real. Only Christ is real. Only his life is real. Only his word, your word, is truth. All else is supposition and lie. We want to give you glory today. We want to lift you up where you belong. We want to glorify and magnify your holy name. Because you have given us the greatest gift mankind could ever receive. You've given us the ability to draw near to the, the creator God. We thank you through the precious life and the blood of our Saviour, Lord Jesus Christ, for that gift. And I pray that, Father, you would help us to learn, help us to grow, help us to understand our place and to fulfil our responsibilities in the body as you have so ordained it. For we ask it in the name of Yeshua. Amen.